Okay, so it is uh, for me a very pleasant task to introduce uh, uh, this year's prize winner, uh, Elizabeth Murchison, and to introduce a little bit about her re research. Now, before I do this, let me just uh, actually come back to what Professor Henze and Dr. Ehler said about the prize and the award, because I think uh, uh, um, Matthias Henze already mentioned many nice things about this award, and there was one you've forgotten. I would like to mention this here, in particular the MBL, because this is one of the very few awards where you can apply for by yourself. Now, in order to give you a little bit of background why uh, we have selected uh, Elizabeth, and I should say that this election every year is, um, I've been now uh, three times, four times on the jury, it's not an easy one. I mean, we always, uh, it's easy to come up with the last 10 and then shortening the list becomes more and more difficult. So we have long discussions, but uh, I'm glad to say that we, in the end, we always arrive at unanimous decisions. Now, I'm coming to the work of Elizabeth and I need to introduce our prize winner a little more. Now, it's a European award. Elizabeth is kind of a European because she is born in Scotland. She has Scottish parent. Uh, her father is think, from Scotland, but her mother is from Tasmania. So she's a truly international person. She grew up in Tasmania, and she also um, then went to um, the University of Melbourne. So she stayed down under for her undergrad education. But then she became truly international, as dictated almost by her family or roots. So she went to the United States, to the Cold Spring Harbor lab, um, to the lab of Greg Hannon for her PhD. And the lab of Greg Hannon, who is interested in the small RNA field, which is a very hot field of molecular biology, she did some very outstanding work, published extremely well and was in a well-launched career track. And then what um, I heard, read, and then talked to Elizabeth about is that she had a kind of an experience being back home. Um, driving home, she found on the roadside, she found a dead devil who was killed by, ex by a car accident, and this devil had a tumor. And she, being a molecular she got interested in this tumor, and then she asked herself, well, how could this tumor spread? And at that time, everyone would say, well, it's is a virus. I mean, there has to be a virus which spreads and which creates these tumors, and this is the only way you can imagine that the tumor can spread among the entire population, which is a problem. And she then apparently took some samples, and then she decided to use her training as a molecular biologist to really get to the ground of this. Elizabeth then went to the Sanger Institute, where she had obviously a lot of support, and so this is an institute specialized for deep sequencing for putting together genomes, and she then sequenced the entire genome of two Tasmanian devils, which was novel. I mean, there was no genomic information yet available. And also, I think, from a few tumor samples, which were also completely sequenced, which then really gave a huge uh, a treasure trove of uh, information, as we all know, as biologists, that with this kind of information, you really can start to become very serious and can find out a lot about things. And she then has um, obviously analyzed uh, in more detail um, what the, in which way the tumor has been changing. I would like to state that the work of Elizabeth Murchison stands out as exemplary. It shows how the commitment of a single person who is well-trained and uses her training to address a biological problem, a fundamental biological problem, can have a major impact. It also shows that the research in a seemingly esoteric field, I mean, esoteric Tasmanian devils, I mean, what, what is this all about? But it shows that this um, research can have a major impact and, um, and can yield fundamental scientific insights and open new avenues for research, which might well turn out to be relevant for human health. So in this way, I think uh, she is a worthy winner of the Eppendorf Award. Thank you very much. So I'm going to just take the next 20 minutes or so to tell you about my research, um, about the Tasmanian devil and the transmissible cancer that's affecting them. Um, so first of all, cancer occurs when a normal cell becomes a cancer cell, when it acquires mutations that activate oncogenes, inactivate tumor suppressor genes, and cause genomic instability. Thus, each and every cancer is in itself its own unique evolutionary process, whereby individual cells act to outcompete each other and outwit the host defenses. And this process is illustrated here. You can see uh, some cells uh, gaining advantage and being selected for here in white, and other cells being less successful. And my research focuses on two cancers, uh, the Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease and the canine transmissible venereal tumor, which are the only two cancers that we know of which have been able to survive beyond the death of the host that gave rise to them. 
And they've done this by acquiring adaptations for the transfer of physical transfer of cells between hosts. And this is shown here. You can see individual cells or small groups of cells being physically transplanted from one host to the other, thus allowing the continued existence of the clone even long after the death of the original host that gave rise to it. In the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to tell you about how I've been using my research to try to use genetics to understand the origin diversity, history, and evolution of these two extremely unusual and interesting cancers. So first of all, the Tasmanian devil. What, what is a Tasmanian devil? Uh, here in Germany, many of you probably haven't ever seen a real life Tasmanian devil. Tasmanian devil is in fact the world's largest carnivorous marsupial. It's about the size of a small dog. And um, you're completely right. They got their name from their terrifying screaming sound that they make. And let me just um, play you that. <laughs> so there must have been a very, very large kangaroo carcass for them to have given that kind of sound. And Tasmanian devils being marsupials, give birth to very, very, very tiny, underdeveloped young. These are actually two, these are four Tasmanian devil babies as they look when they're born. And then at about one year of age, the young disperse, and after that, whenever they meet each other, they tend to behave a bit like this. Um, they tend to bite each other, often quite aggressively, and often around the face. So, uh, Tasmanian devils have a bit of a bad reputation for being feisty and aggressive, but actually around humans, they're quite docile. And this is actually how we trap devils in, in the field. We use these modified pipe traps here with a piece of bait at the end, and the devil goes in, takes the bait, and then it closes this trap. And then you go around in the morning, and the devils, rather than all growling and um, being really aggressive, they tend to be just curled up, asleep, and completely calm. And um, unfortunately, however, Tasmanian devils have become one of the fastest declining mammals due to disease that's ever been recorded. And that's due to the emergence of this disease, uh, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So the story really begins in 1996, when a wildlife photographer, Christo Bars, actually took this photograph of a devil with a large tumor on its face. Um, now, at the time, this was thought to be a one-off, because animals just like humans, can sometimes get strange cancers. However, we now know that this is the first case, or first observed case, of a new disease which is spreading through the Tasmanian devil population. And that, uh, in, uh, that first devil was photographed in 1996 in the northeast of Tasmania. And over the next few years, devils with facial tumors were observed all across the east coast of Tasmania. And about 2004, it had become in increasingly clear that this was a new kind of infectious disease that was spreading through the devil's population. And now 2012, there's actually only one area up in the northwest of Tasmania which is still confirmed to be disease-free. And at the same time, there's been a massive decline in the population of Tasmanian devils in the north, uh, in, in areas that have been affected by the disease for a long time. And at this rate of disease spread and population decline, the entire species is predicted to go extinct in the wild within only 20 to 30 years. Now, in, 19, in 2006, this disease was given a name. It was given the name Tasmanian Devil Facial Tumor Disease, or DFTD. And it was described as a disease that leads to the appearance of tumors on the face of affected Tasmanian devils, which often become very large and, and sometimes ulcerate. If you look at a section through these tumors, they're usually um, densely cellular and often with a necrotic center. And if you look at these cells themselves, this is them, they're um, usually fairly uniform, large, round cells, uh, which we think are of Schwann cell or neural crest origin. Now, when Tasmanian devils get this disease, you often first see it as a small tumor some, somewhere on the mouth or on the, in the lips. But this rapidly progresses towards being uh, absolutely horrific tumors. The next picture I'm going to show is, is a bit horrifying, so please um, look away if you don't want to see it. So this is, a, this is one of the first cases of the tumor that I saw uh, myself, and this is actually pretty, pretty normal. Um, the devils usually get, go on to get these, these hideous, enormous tumors which prevent them from feeding, and usually they die of starvation within a few months. 
Now, the first indication that this tumour was spread as a clone came from studies of the Tasmanian devil chromosomes. So devils have seven pairs of chromosomes shown here, including the sex chromosomes over here. And the devil's cancer has um, highly rearranged chromosomes. So you can see here, missing both copies of chromosome 2, missing the sex chromosomes. And interestingly, it has these highly rearranged uh, marker chromosomes over here. Now, that in itself is not at all unusual. In fact, it's expected for a solid tumor to be highly aneuploid. However, what was unexpected, and this was the work of Anne-Marie Pierce in Tasmania, was that all of the tumors that she examined had almost identical rearrangements. So you can see here in particular, they all have this highly rearranged and, uh, and uh, unique marker chromosome. Now, it's possible that these rearrangements have occurred independently in all of these different tumors, but it seems more likely that, in fact, these rearrangements, these complex rearrangements, perhaps occurred once and has subsequently spread through the population by the transmission of the cancer cells themselves. And so how would they be spread? Well, if you remember, again, uh, this, how I, uh, when I described how devils behave when they bite, meet each other, they tend to bite each other. And we think that the cancer cells actually get off the tumor and get into the saliva of the affected devils. And then when they bite another devil, they actually physically transplant the living cancer cells from one animal to the next. So this is kind of where I became interested. Um, there was this idea that, that the cancer could be a clone, but we didn't really know for sure. And I wanted to test a few predictions using my, some of my genetic skills. So if the devil's cancer is spread by living cancer cells, then we predict that all the cancers should be genetically identical, or at least very similar to each other, and all the cancers should be genetically different to their hosts. So in fact, in this case here, we'd imagine the DNA from this devil himself would be different from the DNA of his tumor. They should be genetically unmatched because they come from different sources. So I decided to put this to the test. Um, I went out and I collected a number of samples. This is the one that I found on the side of the road. Um, and took both normal DNA and tumor DNA from each of these different animals. And then I denotyped them uh, using microsatellites, which are a kind of marker which are quite polymorphic in the population. So if you look around the population, humans, Tasmanian devils, all different species, microsatellites are just simple repeats which vary in length quite frequently in the population. So they're good uh, markers for population genetic studies. So I took these and I first of all looked at a particular microsatellite across the normal devils. So each color here represents a different color, a different genotype at this one microsatellite. And what you can see here is, as expected, the normal devils have a variety of different genotypes at this particular locus, as you would expect. When I looked at the tumors, found something quite interesting. You can see that all the tumors, are, first of all, have, share the same genotype, the red one. And importantly, all of the tumors are genetically distinct from their hosts. So this is very, very good confirmation that these tumors, this, tumor, this cancer in the Tasmanian devil did not arise from its host, but rather was horizontally transferred through the population by the transmission of living cancer cells. So just to summarize, what we think has happened is that a single devil got, the, got, got this cancer. We'll call it the DFDD founder devil. When somatic cells occurred in a single cell of that devil, and that grew into a tumor, and from there, it somehow, we don't really understand how, it got spread to another devil or perhaps several more devils. From there, the cancer got spread to more devils. And from there, it spread all around Tasmania. So each of these tumors all around Tasmania actually is the same tumor that first arose in this single devil that existed uh, some time ago. And these are the cancer cells themselves. I think uh, these are one of the most remarkable cancers that we know of. This is a cancer which arose once and has lived through the is spread through the population, has been able to evade the immune system, and is the only cancer that we know of that's threatening an entire species with extinction. And all the information that encodes uh, how, these, how this cancer is able to evade the immune system and able to spread through the population is encoded in the DNA inside the nucleus of these cells. So my interest was to sequence the DNA, the genome, of this cancer in order to understand how this cancer has, has evolved these incredible properties. 
And this is what brought me a few years ago now to the Sanger Institute, just near Cambridge, a genome sequencing center that had the technology uh, and sequencing power to allow me to take on this project. Um, but in order to do this, the first thing we really needed to do was to develop a few tools for genetics of Tasmanian devils themselves. We really needed to start the Tasmanian Devil Genome Project. And a few years ago, this seemed like a, an impossible task. But actually, having arrived at the Sanger at a time when there's been massive increases in, in the power of next generation sequencing, this was actually a task which we could achieve. And in fact, we sequenced the genome of this, uh, this female devil here called Salem. She comes from um, a, a zoo in Sydney. And just to very quickly summarize what we did was we took DNA from Salem, we sheared it up into small pieces of DNA, and we sequenced these on, uh, on a sequencing machine. Uh, we can only sequence short pieces of DNA uh, with these next generation sequencing machines. And then we did an assembly, we put them all back together again. So this sequencing uh, only took about two weeks. Then the hard work really started with the assembly, which took about one, actually one and a half years. It's a massive problem to assemble a huge eukaryotic genome purely from short reads. And in fact, I was very, very lucky to work with some wonderful people at the Sanger Institute who uh, have developed uh, algorithms and tools to do this type of thing. What I was really interested in, however, was sequencing the genome of the cancer. We were now in a position to start to sequence the genome of this cancer now that we had some basic tools for studying Tasmanian devils. Um, but let me just explain a, a kind of inherent difficulty and perhaps something quite surprising, uh, which we had to take into account before we went ahead to sequence this genome. And that is, when we sequence the genome of uh, the the Tasmanian devil cancer. So say we were to sequence that cancer there. What we're actually sequencing is, in fact, the genome of this devil, the founder devil, plus all of the somatic mutations that have arisen during this lineage through the Tasmanian devils as a somatic cell clone. And so in sequencing the Tasmanian devil, in a way, this founder devil is not really dead, but in a way, it's kind of still alive because its DNA is still alive in all of these tumors in these thousands of devils all around Tasmania today. So in sequencing the devil's genome, the cancer's genome, what we were able to, we were able to have access to two distinct kinds of variants. The germline variants, which can tell us about, which is the natural variants which were present in the genome of that original devil that got the tumor, which can tell us about this devil and what this devil was like and when it lived. And also these somatic variants, which have arisen during this cancer's lineage as a somatic cell clone. And also, in looking at the distribution of somatic variants, we've been able to piece together the phylogeography of this cancer to look at how this tumor has spread through the Tasmanian devil population. So first of all, the first question we were interested in, in understanding was how many somatic mutations are present in the devil cancer genome? And so what we did was we went ahead and we sequenced two different cancer genomes, one from up here in the north of Tasmania and one from the south of Tasmania, and we compared them to each other. And I don't have time to go into a lot of detail about how we did this analysis, but what we found was that the devil cancer's genome is actually surprisingly stable. We found that it has about 20,000 mutations, which is rather fewer than some human cancers. Um, and it had relatively few copy number changes or instabilities. So it seems that in order for a cancer to become transmissible, it doesn't necessarily need to be incredibly unstable. We also searched through the cancer's genome for cancer, potential cancer-causing mutations and mutations in immune genes which could give us clues about how this cancer is evading the immune system. And we found um, about 400 genes uh, which change the coding with mutations which change the coding region uh, of, the, of genes. And some of these are very, very interesting candidates. And in fact, we've got some drug trials going on at the moment in Tasmania to test whether some of them could be good targets for anti-cancer drugs in the Tasmanian devil. But uh, I was also interested in using the germline variant, so the, the natural variants present in the, devil's in the cancer's genome, which uh, were present originally in this devil's genome, in order to find out more about this devil. Where did this devil live? Uh, and so on. And the first thing I was interested in finding out about this devil was what was its gender? 
Because if you remember back to the karyotype of the cancer, it doesn't have any sex chromosomes. But I was wondering whether or not we could do a sex chromosome analysis from the genome in order to try to figure out whether this devil was actually a female or a, or a male Tasmanian devil. So the first thing I did was to uh, do a PCR for, um, to look for, to try to detect the Y chromosome, which is uh, uh, only present in males. So as you can see here, this Y chromosome gene was able, I could detect it in males, but not in females. And it was also absent from the two tumors that I tested. But this does not necessarily mean that this uh, devil was a female, because it's always possible that it had a Y chromosome, which was then subsequently lost in the cancer. So the next thing I did was to look for uh, um, variants on the X chromosome, copy number of the X chromosome. So female devils have two X chromosomes and males have one. They have double the number of variants. And I found that the two tumors I looked at had approximately the same number of variants uh, on the X chromosome as a female, which indicates that this tumor has, X, has two X chromosomes, that it probably originally uh, arose from an animal with two X chromosomes. And therefore, it probably first came from a female. Um, so just to summarize, we now know that this devil back here was probably a female. I'm trying to think of a good name for her. If you have any suggestions, come and let me know afterwards. Uh, who had a single cell which acquired somatic mutations, which then gave rise to this lineage. But in order, by looking at, at the distribution of somatic mutations through the population, I was then interested in trying to figure out how this cancer has spread through the devil population. And in order to do this, I really needed a large number of samples. So in this case, I collaborated with a large number of people back in Tasmania um, to collect about 100 samples from all around Tasmania, both tumors and matching hosts. So each of the black dots on the map it represents an individual tumor. And uh, over here, we have the hosts. And you can see that a large number of the tumors come from a few different sites, particularly the Forestia Peninsula down here in the south of Tasmania. And that's because this was an, an area where there was an ongoing disease suppression trial. So it gave me access to a lot of samples from there. So then what I did was to sequence, to genotype all of these samples for a set of somatic variants to look at how the somatic variants were distributed across the population of tumors. And let me just show you an example. Here's an example of a somatic mitochondrial variant, which I genotyped across all of the tumors and all of the host devils. And I found it only on, in devils, in tumors from devils on this peninsula here, the Forestia Peninsula. So what this suggests is that all of the tumors in this isolated peninsula are actually derived from a single founding tumor that originally arrived in this, in this, pop, in this peninsula and, uh, and populated uh, this peninsula with, with the tumor. And this actually makes sense because in order to get onto that peninsula, you have to go across a fairly narrow bridge here, uh, which actually has a cattle grid as well. So it makes it quite difficult for devils to get on and off the peninsula. So it seems quite plausible that the tumor arose, uh, crossed this bridge once with a single Tasmanian devil and then gave rise to this entire tumor population on the peninsula. So we've been able to use genetics to kind of study how, how this tumor might have spread. Here's another example. This is uh, a somatic variant on chromosome 1. It's a T to C mutation. And I genotyped this again across all of the tumors and all of the hosts and found it only in a number of devils from this, a number of tumors from devils in the north and northwest of Tasmania. Um, so again, this makes sense because uh, actually there's quite a lot of mountains in this area here in Tasmania, in the central part of Tasmania. So it seems likely that that might have provided a barrier for disease spread. So, so the disease... The two, this mutation might have arisen somewhere here and has spread this way, but not that way. And so we've been able to take a lot of data of this type and put it together, and we've kind of built a, a, bit of a disease map of how the tumor has spread around Tasmania, and it seems rather like the tumor has spread quite widely throughout the mainland of Tasmania, but there's a few interesting bottlenecks and areas with uh, local distribution, such as this peninsula down here and a few other areas. But this is also going to be uh, an area of interest in the future as we try to protect devils uh, up in the north of northwest of Tasmania, the area that the disease has not yet arrived in. 
So what's next for the Tasmanian devil? Well, at the moment, the outlook is quite bleak for the devils. Um, uh, there's, the disease is continuing to spread. It's continuing to move into areas that were previously not affected by the tumor. And at the moment, most of the effort back in Tasmania is on captive breeding programs, keeping devils alive by putting them in quarantine and keeping them breeding so that at least the Tasmanian devil species is kept alive, even if they go extinct in the wild. Uh, there's a lot of interest in identifying resistant devils uh, that might have lower susceptibility to the tumor, but actually we still don't know whether that even exists, whether devils uh, with resistance are, are out there. Uh, my interest is to develop vaccines and therapies for the disease um, that we can then quickly use in the field to try to prevent the disease spreading. But I think in order to, to get to this step, we really need to understand more about this disease uh, it's, 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 it's pathogenesis and how it interacts with its host. Um, so just briefly for the next uh, couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you about the other cancer that I've been working on, the canine transmissible venereal tumor, which is uh, also an absolutely fascinating disease. Um, it's a sexually transmitted cancer that affects dogs, and at least the appearance of these rather revolting um, genital tumors. And the next picture is also going to be a bit horrible, so please, um, please look away. If, if you don't want to see it. So it, it leads to the appearance of these quite um, hemorrhagic tumors, which are usually quite localized around the genital region of affected dogs. Interestingly, in contrast to the devil tumor, this uh, dog tumor tends to remain very localized and also is curable. So if you can treat it with chemotherapy and the, devil, uh, the dogs tend to, um, uh, the tumor tends to regress in the dogs. The amazing thing about this tumor is that it's found everywhere in the world. Each of these dots here represents a, a, a report of the cancer. It's actually found just about everywhere. Um, it's particularly common in areas when there's large populations of free-roaming sexually active dogs which tend to spread the, uh, spread the disease. The disease was first described in German, actually, um, back in 1876 by a Russian scientist, M.A. Novinsky, who'd been trying to uh, develop a model for studying cancer by injecting cancers into all sorts of different species. And all of his injection experiments failed until he tried this dog cancer. And remarkably, this dog cancer was able to survive in different um, hosts. And of course, he didn't know that he'd stumbled upon perhaps one of the only cases which would have worked in, in his experiments because it's a cancer which is naturally transmissible. But anyway, Novinsky's experiments tell us that this tumor lineage is at least 130 years old. But genetic evidence from a number of different groups suggests that this cancer may have in fact first originated more than 6,000 years ago. So this is the oldest somatic cell lineage that we know of. And also, a couple of groups have looked at the genetic similarity of CTVT, this tumor, with a number of different dog breeds. And it seems that the tumor bears most resemblance to wolves. So it seems that this cancer probably arose um, possibly thousands of years ago in a wolf, and from there has spread all around the world and, um, and has become the probably most successful cancer in the world. And these are the cells themselves. I always get a kind of um, funny feeling when I look at these cells down the microscope, and I think that these cells actually have, uh, have, have become an, uh, the, almost the ultimate parasite. They are able to evade the immune system, to colonize multiple hosts. They've conquered the world probably more than once. And, um, and they, they're, almost a, they're a perfect pathogen because they don't normally kill their hosts, yet they interact with their hosts in quite a uh, successful manner. And so I've also been sequencing the genomes of these cancers, of this cancer. I've, in fact, sequenced several tumors from around the world, and it looks like there's more mutations in this cancer than any cancer that's ever been looked at before. So it's a, it's a really pretty unique organism in a way. It's kind of like its own biological entity. So before I finish up, the question on everybody's lips is probably, how do these transmissible cancers evade the immune system when they colonize unrelated hosts? And this is a very good question, and one that we don't really understand, because really, this can these cancers are really like an organ transplant. You transplant an organ from one person to another, it normally gets rejected by non-self by the immune system. Somehow, this is not happening with the Tasmanian devil and the dog cancers. They've been able to survive despite 
uh, being introduced into animals with perfectly good functional immune systems. And we don't understand how this works, but uh, from the dog cancer, we have a few ideas. We think that these cancers, or the dog cancer at least, has evolved mechanisms to downregulate MHC expression on the cell surface so that it doesn't express the normal cell surface markers which mark cells as cell, self and non-self and allow the immune system to interact uh, to, to detect non-self tissue. And also we think that the tumors are actually directly producing immunosuppressive cytokines which directly uh, interact with the host's immune system and prevent uh, an immune reaction. But there's a lot more work to be done and some of our work with the genetics has led to interesting avenues of, uh, of, in of investigation in this area. So finally, this leads to the question, if all a cancer needs in order to evade the immune system is, uh, sorry, in order to become transmissible is a mechanism to evade the immune system, then do all cancers have the potential to be transmissible? Is it just that, some, that cancers don't normally have the opportunity to be physically transplanted into another individual? And this is a question which fascinated um, Dr. Chester Southam, who was a, uh, an oncologist back in the 1950s who actually decided to put this to the test by injecting living cancer cells into other people to see if they would continue to grow in separate individuals. And actually, here, this is the days, I have to say, this is the days before um, ethics committees, and so all sorts of things were um, do it possible in those days. And here he is actually injecting one of these volunteers who in fact was a, an inmate at Ohio State Penitentiary um, with living cancer cells from a different person. And he did this to hundreds of people, and you'll be relieved to hear that, in fact, almost none of them went on to develop cancer from the injected cells. In fact, most of them went on to develop tumors, which were fairly short-lived and regressed within a matter of weeks. So in most cases, the immune system is capable of detecting and rejecting uh, foreign cancers. However, there are a small number of cases in the literature, uh, and here's one in particular which I find very interesting, of cancers which have been transplanted between individuals that have been able to survive. So this is a case here reported in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago of, uh, of a surgeon who was operating on a cancer patient and accidentally inoculated himself with cancer cells from the, uh, from the patient. And a few months later, he went on to develop cancer in the site where he cut himself, and it turned out, by looking at genetics, that this cancer was, in fact, uh, the cancer from the patient. And these are unrelated people. Um, and so in, it can, in some cases, occur in humans. So what can we learn from clonally transmissible cancers? Well, I think in order to become transmissible, a cancer really needs two things. It needs a mechanism of transmission, uh, so biting or sexual transmission in the dogs. It also needs uh, uh, to evolve mechanisms to evade the immune system, and this probably involves uh, downregulation of host of cell surface antigens and, and production of uh, immunosuppressive cytokines. But the fact that we've only seen totally transmissible cancers twice in uh, in our time suggests that. The acquisition of these different mutations is, is a very, very rare event, so it's unlikely that it will occur. But the fact that we have seen it in two animals, I think, does also indicate that it can occur with some frequency, and it's possible that cancers such as these have even led to the extinction of species in the past, and that they could occur in other species, including humans. I think this is something that we really need to understand. So from there, I'd just like to thank uh, the many people who've um, who've made this work, uh, allowed me to, to kind of pursue this work in a very independent manner, particularly Mike Stratton, who uh, is the head of the Sanger Institute, who invited me over and has provided endless amounts of inspiration and support for me to, uh, to do this project. And the main players in the Tasmanian Devil Genome work uh, are Ludmil Ole Zemin and, and David Bentley, who've provided sequencing and analysis work. But really, this has been a worldwide effort, and this has involved collaborators from, uh, obviously, many from Tasmania, but also many, many people who've collected samples uh, in very, very distant parts of the world, dog samples, devil samples, uh, provided analysis. And actually, one of the things I'm hoping to do with the uh, prize money from this award is to 
is to uh, go and, and to engage these collaborators more uh, fully and perhaps go and visit some of, some of these collaborators in interesting places, uh, take the opportunity to, to collect as many samples as possible from distant parts of the world and to invite uh, these collaborators to Europe, to the UK, to, to engage in, uh, in a kind of international transmissible cancer project. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for making this kind of uh, dream that I've always had to in, engage more with worldwide scientists a, a, a reality. So finally, I'd just like to thank everybody, uh, particularly the committee and uh, to Eppendorf and to Nature to, for, for um, selecting me for this award. It's been an absolute honor. And um, thank you also to my family who are visiting from Tasmania and have uh, been able to come over here and, and help me to celebrate tonight. So thank you very, very, very much.